I just needed to get the opportunity to reset. And, and as it got closer and closer, obviously there was a lot of other questions about my future that uh, have been, you know, on the mind and been contemplated. And mm-hmm. I knew it'd be a good opportunity to kind of sit with those things, but that wasn't the main reason I was doing it. It was, it was how often do we ever unplug? You know, how often do we even set our phones down for a little bit, read a book instead of watch TV, you know, meditate instead of listen to music, or whatever it might be, you know, that, that allows us to kind of disconnect from technology and from the world and like give ourselves a gift of uh, rest. You know, I spent parts of uh, a couple of days imagining what it would be like to uh, retire and then imagining what it would be like to continue to play. Instead of trying so hard to be, I'm not just a football player. What if I just embraced I am a football player? Mm. And look at how fucking beautiful it's impacted my life. And there's probably people that think I'm done. I thought I was done, you know, before I became COVID MVP twice. Mm. So again, there'd be plenty of inspiration down that road. But I'm not looking for somebody to tell me what the answer is. Uh, all the answers are right inside me. And I, I touched uh, many of them and definitely the feelings uh, on both sides during the darkness. And I'm thankful for that time. My brother, you're out of the black. Mm-hmm. Brother of the black. Not too many people I know have done that journey. How was the first moment when the light was fully out and the door closed and you knew you had 96 hours of black in front of you? There was a... In excitement, I think uh-huh. there was there was the the understanding that I was walking into the unknown, and I think it's part anxiety and part excitement. Like, yeah. what is going to come through in these four nights, and also what is going to come through in these four nights? You know, mm-hmm. just the dichotomy of um, just the unknown. Um, so I lit a little candle. I closed the door. And kind of arranged my food on my bed where I was, um, where I was going to eat it, and then I blew that candle out, mm. and that started um, a pretty incredible, uh, difficult at times, uh, four nights. Yeah, there's for people who haven't experienced a darkness retreat or absolute black. I don't think most people actually even understand the difference between dark and black, right? Like a lot of people will say, it's like solitary confinement. I'm like, no, 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 no. Solitary confinement, they have a very small window and a little bit of light, some fluorescent light, something. And a little bit of light in a confined space is actually torture. Like that would make you go crazy. But in the black, yes, there's confines. You can bump into shit in the room, but it's like the limitless void that you're in. It's a different thing. It's, yeah, it, it's definitely not having done anything close to this. I mean, I used to sleep with blackout shades and, mm-hmm. but even still you can uh, see certain kind of shapes and recognize the room and you're in a brand new room and you try and get the picture of, okay, there's where my bed is. And then, you know, it's four steps, medium sized steps to the bathroom. Only thing I can drill you is this wall on the left here besides the bed. And then once you get to the bathtub, You take a right and it's about three steps. You got to watch out for this big hook that's coming out of the wall. So (laughs) They got a big hook on the wall. (laughs) Well, it's not. It's it's dicey. It was a dangerous hook, (laughs) potentially, if you didn't put the towel. I Uh put the towel over the hook. It was was, was a towel hook. But when I was just standing there without it, we were sitting there without a towel. I was like, that would be really dangerous. You could just take your eye out. Did you fuck yourself up at all? Oh my God, so many times, so many times. You know, I'd heard everything about how to walk, you know, like a ballerina or walk with your arms out or whatever it might be. That's that's (laughs) typical. Most of the time your legs are splayed out and you're walking. It's a ballerina. Walk on toe, of course. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, of course. But that's actually how you injured your toe that season. Nobody knows that. uh You went on point, but actually Mm -hmm. your ballet training just just, gave out. (laughs) It just gave out. Gave out. You're too big up, too bulky up top. <laughs> you, know? yeah. you weren't as light on your feet as you were in the Cal days, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what yeah, happened. That's a good one. I fucked myself up bad. I don't know if I told you the story of how that happened. So I had a little, I had a little desk and I had a wicker chair 
that had like an arc of like the wicker around, mm -hmm. whatever, I don't know, looked like some bamboo type of light wood. Anyways, light chair. I didn't tuck it back in to the desk after I was done. So I left it in the middle of the room. So I come mm -hmm. out of my shower. My, my bathroom is like the size of an RV bathroom, like tiny, tiny. tiny. Yep. So I couldn't even really dry off in there because I'm like bumping up in the toilet. There's no like space. So I go out to the middle of the room, which has a nice rug. And again, I was in a cold place too in Germany. So <clears throat> go in there, I'm standing, standing on the rug and I go to dry off my ankles and I was going kind of fast because I was kind of dry. So I go push my both hands down and my head down and just smash the bridge of my nose right on the back of the chair. Oh my God. <laughs> like fucking hard. <laughs> like I was bleeding. Yeah. And I went into a small fit of rage at that point and I fucking threw the chair and I just sat with myself in the darkness and was like, God damn it. Now I got to find the chair. Hopefully I didn't break it. I will have nowhere to sit. But yeah. I had like a little mini fucking anger tantrum. I didn't, yeah, I didn't have anything drastic like that. It actually made me laugh uh, hysterically every time it happened, honestly, <laughs> because all I was thinking about was if there was video of this right now, you know, and maybe there is, <laughs> you know, that's the funny part about it. They've been filming you, you know, in the yeah, dark for full, full four in, days and this is the gift they give you. Oh, by the way, we have all this yeah. footage. Here's a highlight list of the 22 times you drilled different parts of your body yeah. and all the other bizarre things you did. But my whole thing was like, okay. The worst thing to drill myself on would be that hook. So I put a, <laughs> I put a, yeah. put a towel on that, my towel on that, in the sink, right? Because uh -huh. the sink was super sturdy. And it was also, uh, because the bathroom was so small, there was just the toilet and the sink in the bathroom. Um, it was, it was dangerously close to the toilet where if you were, you know, move slightly to maybe wipe or weren't really thinking about, you know, where the sink was to bend down and, you know, brush your teeth or whatever, you could definitely drill it. And I drilled it one time. <laughs> and uh, I don't think I, I didn't have any you know, major damage, but um, it was the last day too. I was like, I fucking made it through it. <laughs> I didn't drill my head at all. You know, I ran in some things, shoulders, arms, yeah, of course. knees, of, of course. course. And a couple of the most disorienting things were a couple of times, you know, I there was like, on the other side of the bed was a kind of a little mat, yoga mat, and like a little uh, meditation uh, seat, you know, and a little mat. And so you definitely uh, meditate in you know, a, a decent amount. It's much easier with absolutely zero distractions and zero noises. I mean, we couldn't really hear any nature noises. We were so there was in there. quiet snow yeah. that was on the, uh, on the outside, right? But, but the worst part was being disoriented coming out of one of those like meditations where... Uh -huh. You're like, I think the bed's over here. And that's how I ran into things multiple times because yeah. I think, oh, I'm good. And bang, you know, yeah. right to the yeah, wall yeah, for sure. Ding. There's yeah. the there's the bathtub. And Especially like, oh. when you apply those like the meditative technologies that like if you get into a deep meditative state, at that point, the void becomes really the void. And then mm. you really lose track of like, whoa, like really where the fuck am I? But that's also when some of the visions come it's yeah. on the backside of these deep meditations that you can get in there which was amazing and then also you know dangerous on the flip side right, right. <laughs> how did you uh how did you do the toothpaste on the toothbrush i came up with a good idea i oh. put the toothpaste in my mouth that's what i did did you that's yeah. what i did i that's thought i was like I'm the <laughs> that's the smartest I person i kept trying in the world <laughs> I, kept, right? I kept missing the what fucking the, other people of, yeah there's no and or it was way it too much to, you know way too much i'm like yeah. you know what just in my mouth yeah yeah that's the move. Problem solved. And then how about how about wiping? Because for me, I had a little shower. So I just, I never knew when I was done, you know? It's like, you can't look at it. I wasn't going to sniff it. So I just hopped in the shower. Listen, I, I, you know, I talked to Eric, who was in there. Uh, that was one of the questions that he asked as well. Um, so obviously, you guys had the same type of issues. <laughs> I didn't really have the, you know, I had those, I think partly because of the diet that we were eating. Yeah. Um, you know, I had very, very smooth, smooth. How many times twos. do you have? How many times do you have a ghost shit where you shit and then you wipe and there's nothing there? That was honestly that was most of the time. And damn, the, it was it was. I've brilliant. had like less than ten ghost shits in my life. Oh my, yeah, no, in my life, not not that many, <laughs> but it's obviously all diet related because you know I was grubbing on these big salads that that they had for us, and that's probably a little out of the norm for you know to eat a humongous salad like every mm. single dinner but 
Yeah, my dumps were super smooth. And <laughs> in my mind, now this is my own rationalization, they were they were all two wipers. They were yeah. two wipers and, <laughs> and done. So it so, didn't need more than two wipes. Honestly, there I mean, were, we were multiple. The, we could check the underwear for the record. Well, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we could. There were we multiple, could. though, that I didn't even think I needed a wipe. Man, you you really killed it on that side. Yeah. It was not not me. One time, so we were eating raw vegan food. So I requested more coconut oil in my little morning smoothie because mm -hmm. that's what we got. So it's like, I wrote a little note because you write a little note. Obviously, it's chicken scratch in the dark. Write a little note, set it out on the table where they set the food. And I was like, please, more coconut oil. <laughs> and then they made a fatty coconut oil smoothie for me. And then I just had vicious diarrhea for mm -hmm. like the next five hours. Yeah. That was one of my adventures in the dark. That's fun. I bet. Because <laughs> right? splashing everywhere in the bottom. and <laughs> it's, it's These things are the things that people don't actually understand. Obviously, we're talking about kind of the funny aspects of being in the black. But the black is really, it is an isolation of you with yourself. Like mm -hmm. there's a technology that we're both aware of that the ayahuasca shamans use. It's called the dieta. And in the dieta, you're connecting with the spirit of a plant that you're dieting. And you're isolating yourself from all other communication and contact. The darkness is like dieting yourself. It's like you're in a diet where it's only you in your own energy field. And there's nothing else but you. And I imagine that's what drew you in. Because you had some questions to answer. You know, and you wanted to go into the deepest recesses of yourself. And, you know, when I heard that you were going to the darkness, I was like, oh, fuck yeah. Because that's a place where you get to actually see what's on the inside. It's almost like the darkness illuminates our own ability to see ourselves. Like we see ourselves in the dark. There's Khalil Gibran had a quote. There's two men, <clears throat> one who is asleep in the light and the other is awake in the darkness. And I don't think he was talking about a darkness retreat, but what he was talking about was how the external world will draw your attention in a million places. But in the darkness, you illuminate the interior of the self. Yeah. I mean, I love that quote. Um, for me, you know, we've had it on the calendar for a while. I thought it'd be an awesome opportunity to reset. You know, I always like to take uh, the first month of the off season and, and relax kind of, disconnect. Um, and then, you know, towards the end of that month, start to think about how do I reset my body and mind? Um, body, I like to do a lot of different types of um, uh, dieting, fasting. Ayurvedic cleanses. Ayurvedic cleanses, um, which have been incredible. Um, but I thought this would be really, really special. And I'd obviously talk to some people who had, who had been, and uh, Eric and I, you know, the ability to go with somebody, I'd be sitting in the same room, but just the fact that I'm in there and knowing that he's in there was, you know, when it was something that I thought would be pretty cool. No one were both kind of doing this, uh, you know, this thing together. And I just needed to, to get the opportunity to reset. And, and as it got closer and closer, obviously there was a lot of other questions about my future that, uh, have been, you know, on the mind and been contemplated. And mm -hmm. I knew it'd be a good opportunity to kind of sit with those things, but that wasn't the main reason I was doing it. It was, it was, how often do we ever unplug? You know, mm -hmm. How often do we even set our phones down for a little bit? You know, read a book instead of watch TV, you know, meditate instead of listen to music, um, whatever it might be, you know, that, that allows us to kind of disconnect from technology and from the world and like give ourselves a gift of uh, rest. Yeah. So that's, that, that was the most important thing to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's interesting aspect of rest because it's simultaneously the deepest rest because there's just nothing there and time slows way down you actually lose track of time almost entirely mm -hmm. you wake up in the middle of the night you don't know what time is it is it 2 a.m yeah it must be eight o'clock like six, six a.m yeah and then yeah. you're like i think breakfast is coming soon you're like maybe and then you're waiting in your bed you know like oh, he's got to be coming with the food now he maybe forgot yeah yeah totally. did he forget the food or is this a test <laughs> they don't feed you on the second and third day what is going on yeah. here yeah so i think everybody imagined that you went right in and you started thinking about football right away right because there's a lot of people waiting with bated breath to hear what your thoughts are about the continuation of your career. But, you know, hearing you talk about it, there was actually 
other stuff that came to the forefront that actually arose organically from your psyche that you wanted to kind of process and work through. So how did the, how did the journey start for you? Well, I wanted to have a loose plan, uh, but not be rigid. I wanted to leave space for anything that was going to come through. And there was going to be hours of contemplation, hours of, you know, on a, you know, on the yoga mat or meditation or in the bathtub or laying on my bed where I just had time to just think in the quiet, in the absolute darkness. Um, but one little, you know, nugget that I'd gotten from a friend before I went in was to make sure that you allow the rest to set in before you start to mm -hmm. try and figure out the world. Mm -hmm. And so I really, uh, that first night, uh, you know, I was in bed, dinner was at six. I was asleep before seven for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, had a beautiful night's sleep. And then I really wanted to contemplate some things with, um, with some relationships in my life, uh, some family stuff, and then obviously, uh, you know, career stuff and just mm -hmm. kind of let whatever was going to come in, come in. And, uh, it did. It definitely did. There was a lot of, a lot of great contemplation the first day and a lot of lessons, um, around, you know, how I show up in the world and how I show up to, you know, in my relationships and, uh, friendships. And, uh, there was definitely some, uh, interesting insights, uh, you know, around, uh, you know, my childhood and things that happened in my mm -hmm. childhood that I was able to, to sit with and heal. And, and then, uh, you know, I spent parts of uh, a couple of the days imagining what it would be like to, uh, retire and then imagining what it would be like to continue to play. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, what I sense and what I feel from just the limited amount that I've seen on, you know, sports casting, in kind of the general media is it feels to me, you know, you're my brother and you know, like there's a, there's a friendship that extends beyond even time. Right. And I see you in the fullness of yourself and that's what I care about more than anything. So for me, thinking about you going into the darkness, it's a far different thing than I think what the media wants, which is like, this is a time where Aaron better be fucking thinking about football the whole time. You know, it's like they try to reduce you to like a, a football robot, you know, and like, that's what they want. Like, all right, a football robot needs to go in here to figure it out. But it's like, it's a far more holistic view of you as a human being who just happens to play football. Yeah. You know, I think that that's one thing that really uh, was interesting around this whole last, you know, few weeks, you know, I obviously do the McAfee show and, and it's a wide open show. You know, we talk about a lot of different topics and just about you know, really everything is, you know, is fair game. There's nothing that's off limits. Um, and, you know, I've basically been saying the same thing since the end of the season. I'm going to take some time. I'm going to get away from it. I'm going to get away from the emotion of the season and start to let the, you know, the off season settle in and then see how I'm feeling and what I want to do moving forward with my future. Um and obviously that's not good enough because it doesn't create a big enough story. So, you know, then, then things are said and made up and, and, uh, unnamed sources and all the, you know, the common media, you know, cycle, which can be uh, draining if you give it a lot of energy, which I don't. But I think the thing that was interesting to me was just how people so desperately wanted to either be a part of this story and make it out to be that I was going in the dark to, figure out the only reason was to go in there and figure out if I'm going to play or not play. Number one, that's not true. It never was true. You know, all I mentioned about it when I mentioned on the McAfee show was I'm going to do an isolation retreat. And I feel like afterwards I'll be in a better place to, you know, to make a decision about, you know, what I'm thinking mm -hmm. about for the future. Um, and then there was, you know, people who wanted to be a part of the story again and said, Oh, he's going in on, Monday after the Super Bowl, and then I was going on McAfee on Tuesday, and then the same people were like, oh, well, he must be coming out, you know, after one day to, you know, to do the McAfee show. I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> stop <laughs> Just stop with up. the bullshit. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, then he's going in on Thursday. It's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, he went in on Monday, and he came out on Wednesday. He's only in there for two nights. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I understand that, you know, much of my life I think has been uh, interesting to people because I have been a little bit of an enigma at times with, uh, you know, trying to keep my private life uh, private uh, because I believed that that was really important and and I didn't want to work through problems with my family in the public sphere, as unfortunately they did at times. Um, And so there was this mystery around me. And then I, you know, did uh, kind of a preliminary opening to this with a show with a local beat reporter um, where I was, I think, a little more honest and people started to go, oh, okay, this guy's you know interesting. He's starting to talk about some stuff. And then um, obviously the McAfee show has showed a different side of me and mm-hmm. talking about with you last summer about uh, plant medicine, I think was um, a great opportunity to talk about the things that are important to me. Yeah. Um, and it's all kind of been a, a process, but it is interesting to see how people wanted to spin this in a certain way. There was almost like a negative thing, like, um, why would you want somebody on your team who has to contemplate whether he wants to play football or not? You know, you want me to talk about, you want athletes to talk openly and honestly about mental health and champion them. But when people are taking time to contemplate their future, to reset their minds, to, um, uh, to really work on themselves, we're, we're going to try and cut that down. I think that's my issue with some, you know, with with some of the media is, and really life in general. And that's, you know, I, I never really do this anymore. I used to a lot when it was fun, but but I responded to a guy on Twitter uh, who was trying, who was kind of ripping the darkness retreat, and I said one of my favorite quotes, which is from Ted Lasso, and it might not be Ted Lasso said it on the show, but. It was uh, be curious, not judgmental. And I, I remember watching that clip on, and I love the show. And I remember watching that clip and just seeing how beautiful that moment was in the bar as he's playing darts and trying to win for his, you know, his sweet boss who's been kind of belittled by her former husband, and he's parading this young girl around, and um, and he basically says, "You don't, you actually don't know me. You haven't taken the time to get to know me." And mm-hmm. if he did, you would have known. Yeah, I play darts mm-hmm. every Sunday with my dad. And I just think there's such a sweet moment about that. And I think part of my life is some of, is is responding that way. Like you don't, you don't know me. Yeah. But I'm trying to give you a glimpse. Right. I'm trying to, because I want, I want to be seen. Right. I want you to understand me a little bit more, and I want to inspire people as well to have the freedom to go do those things. Mm-hmm. But don't tear it down. Yeah. Don't tear it down. Be interested. You don't understand ayahuasca, plant medicine, darkness retreats, fit for service. Mm -hmm. You know, anything that we, you know, that we love to do and talk about, you know, first response shouldn't be trying to tear it down. Right. Be interested or just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. You can't argue both sides. You can't say you know, we need to really pay attention to supporting the mental health of all of our players. And and then when players are actually supporting their own mental health, you start to criticize them for it, you know, not recognizing that it is part of that mindset where football is everything and the only thing that creates so many challenges. There's been lots of documentaries about it, about what happens after somebody wins a gold medal or somebody wins something where the entire locus of their identity has been placed in the function of what they do. And then that's finite. That ends. There's a whole big ass long life afterwards. So if you haven't built different ways, technologies, practices to explore your inner universe, it's going to be incredibly hard. So like this as a model for being like, yeah, ball out. Like when you're playing, fucking go for it. And that's whether you're playing in front of the big lights or we're playing in the backyard, playing hoop, like, <laughs> go for it. That feels know? like the big lights. In the <laughs> it does, it does. Because we definitely talk about it. We yeah. probably, probably have more conversations about it. Way than... more. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think for me, this past season was really, you know, it was, it was special, man. It was really, really special to be there with you. And I just think back to, like, some of those moments. And obviously, there's the fucking incredible celebration of the big wins and and all that. but. There was so many like the quiet moments and the hard moments, you know, like the hard moments before, you know, before that Dallas game, you know, and that game, I mean, if I think of some of the, one of the top moments of my life, it was everything that led up to that Dallas game 
and and right after that Dallas game too and and it was just being with you the the man who was also playing football like but being with my brother and uh fuck like like nobody nobody really knows what that's like unless they were there you know yeah i mean uh I was just running through some of the images, you know, from the season with having you out to so many games. I mean, you were in um, Miami, you were in Tampa, you came to multiple games at home. Where else did you come? Yeah, yeah. it was Miami, Tampa, and then uh, like, I think four home games. Yeah. But the, you know, those moments after the games were, were and before the games were so sweet. But the moment after the Dallas game was, was just really, really special to me. Yeah. You know, to be able to walk out of the locker room after the the everything that happened that day, I mean, reconnecting with Mike in a really, really special way, McCarthy, my longtime coach, and having some really special moments with him pregame. And then being down and coming back, you know, fourteen in the fourth quarter and winning in overtime. And then all the conversations we had, had preceding leading up to that game. Um and then to share and embrace after the game and just like, you know, weep. It, yeah. was, it was wild. And it's just one of those special, special moments that you just don't, uh, you're never going to forget, but you don't expect like just how it's, how people can show up for you at just the right time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, leading up to that game, that was a, uh, that was a tough stretch, you know, talking to you on the phone before I got out there. We'd lost know, five straight, <laughs> five, lost five straight games. Yeah. You got your hand, your thumb, your thumb was broken. fractured. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, it was a low, it was a low moment. And I was like, uh, you know, I remember we, t I talked to you maybe Tuesday and then I was coming out Thursday and it was like, you know, like this is rock bottom. You know, and so the first thing, the first concept that we were talking about was like, all right, here's bottom, like feel it, feel. And this is for everybody, right? This is not, this applies to this specific situation, but feel the bottom and feel the weight of it, feel the stableness of actually the bottom and the knowing that like, all right, you know, yeah, you could have lost more games than five, but five was like already at the threshold of just fucking nightmare material, right? Yeah. So it's like, so it's like <laughs> at that moment, like here's bottom. And I think that got us to, you know, when I got out there and then we started in some real deep, you know, kind of conversations and contemplations. And one of the things that I'd been working through is something I've been tracking my whole life, which is there's me. And then there's this force that I call the anti me that is constantly trying to fuck me up. Like just finding a way to drag my attention from my highest focus or harness the voice in my own head, my superego, my inner judge, and just beat me down in a way. And so I just started sharing some of my experience about the journey of you versus anti-you. And that really kind of landed for you too, as it does with most people, because we know that force. It's like it's this inner, it's the inner resistance, as Stephen Pressfield would say, or the Yitzhar Hara, as the Kabbalists would say. Yeah, strong too. It's a, it's, it's the greatest opponent you're going to face because it knows you inside and out, and it knows all your triggers, yeah, and and how to deceive you, and it shows up in a, in a myriad of different ways. But it's that for me is that negative self talk that that sitting on your shoulder saying, you know, you can't do this. You, you know, maybe you should quit. You know, maybe it's time to move on. You don't have it anymore. Like you're not, you're not good anymore. You suck. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it might be during those games and then, and off the field, it's, you know, just all the negative things you could possibly think about yourself. So like putting a name to that was awesome. And then just like upping the awareness around that and letting that force know not today. Not today. Not today. Not today. And we we talked about how, so in this version of you, which like you said, it's like a carbon copy of you. It is an exact copy of you that knows all of your weaknesses, knows all of the ways to talk shit to you in just the most perfect way. And because it has full access to your psyche, it's like you make a carbon copy like those martial arts movies where the final contest is, is Bruce Lee versus Bruce Lee, you know, in that kind of contest. 
And, you know, I ultimately realized that the purpose of that force was to drive evolution. Because if you're competing against somebody that's exactly as good as you, the only way to beat them is to evolve, is to actually become a little bit better. And in that moment of becoming a little bit better, the force that, you know, we talked about calling on was the king. Yeah. You know, like call on the king, the highest version of yourself to which everybody else, including the anti-you, has to bend the knee when you call the king forward. And I remember watching that game from the box and I could tell like, oh shit, like the battle is on. It was 28-14 and, and it was like, all right. And I could, I, even though, you know, I can't, they didn't follow you in the sidelines and I have a bunch of close-ups of your face. I could feel that that was like, that was a place where there was a significant moment of Aaron versus the anti-Aaron. Yeah, I think it shows up a lot of times in the, oh, here we go again mindset. You know, when we getting our ass whooped in various ways over the last five weeks. And what's going to happen this time? Oh, we're going to have this, you know, punt block or whatever. And then this short field and turnover. And, um, but, you know, there's so much that goes into being able to kind of beat back that force. But at the, in, at the root of it is very simple. It's knowing who you are yeah. and reminding yourself of who you actually are. And you refer to it, which I love as the king, you know, and reminding yourself who you are in those moments for me allowed me to, to win those battles against myself. Mm -hmm. And there was moments in that game where I was banged up and, um, you know, thumbs broken, thumbs jacked losing up, losing the game, losing the game. Maybe, you know, you know, they're ready to run me out of town and sit me down on the bench and there was talk about that right yeah and scrap the season uh, sit randall down sit big dog down maybe put a couple guys who've been banged up on ir and just say hey this wasn't our year and although we lost the next two games i just felt like we needed to get one of this those three in that stretch we had dallas we had tennessee we had philly and that one was a big turning point, I think, for all of us. And, you know, we didn't play our best game the next week, but we played tough, and and then we played Philly tough, and then we won four straight and gave ourselves a chance. But that night was really special for a number of different reasons, but most of all, um, that, you know, you were there, that we had spent that time together, and that in those moments of doubt that came up, I said, hey, bro, you're really good at this, <laughs> but not today. Not today, anti me. <laughs> yeah, not anti today. Mad respect, anti me, yeah. but not fucking today. You guys started to make that run, you know, to close the gap of you know the two touchdown deficit, which I think heard some stat that the Cowboys had like maybe never lost a game when they were up by fourteen in the fourth, yeah, in the fourth quarter. So odds are way against you, but mm -hmm. there was some force that I could just feel, and that's the interesting aspect of of any anybody who plays sports we talk about momentum and we talk about it as if it's almost like this rational material thing and we also kind of get that it's emotional but it you can feel an energy of momentum you can feel it if you play and if you're really feeling it you can feel the energy you know if you're tapped into the game as well and there was something that started to shift and it was like oh shit like here comes here comes the king. Like the king's been fucking bloodied and beaten and the lion has been, you know, trapped in a corner for a long time. But there's a fucking roar that's ready to emerge and your whole squad, you know, kind of lined up behind you. Everybody was permeated, not just you, but it was a feeling. And, and I remember the, like that feeling of like, all right, here we fucking go. And then it started, you know, the drive started and the scoring started. Yeah, I mean, that was a, the night that uh, Christian Watson will never forget because yeah. uh, he came out, I threw him two dimes, and he dropped them both. And he was over on the sideline, I think, kind of feeling sorry for himself and, and pissed off. And then I threw him a deep ball, and he made a ridiculous over-the-shoulder catch. Ridiculous. And then backflipped and was like, and here I am. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. 
Wow. His, his Christian his, versus anti-Christian had to be fucking strong I at mean, that moment. It, and the King Christian showed up yeah. that fucking day. And it lasted the rest of the year. Yeah. And maybe the rest of his career. Yeah. How fucking sweet is that? You know? So cool. But the biggest play that got us going was we had fourth and eight. And I had kind of come up with this play during the week that was based off of some stuff I'd seen on on tape where I felt like if we got in a three-man stack and instead of breaking out like the team we had watched had done, do a couple inbreakers, that we could maybe get Christian free on a deep uh, uh, deep post. And Matt called it in on fourth down. He said, hey, you want, uh, I can't what we call it, but hey, you want this play? I said, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I hit Christian for a touchdown, and and that kind of changed things. We stopped him. We had a nice, beautiful, long drive. Uh, we got it. We went to overtime. You know, they had a chance in in uh, in our territory. They were marching down. And they were thinking, oh, man, like, after all this, we've come yeah. back. Like, are yeah. we really going to lose this in overtime? And uh, Well, also had a chance to win in regulation. You know, there was that, if I recall correctly, like had a chance to kick a field goal, like make the right drive and it didn't happen. Yeah. And it was like, that was that moment also where the anti you could have been like, oh, fuck, that was it. Now, yeah. now this, and now we don't even have the ball first in overtime. Fucking A. Yeah. But there was just something different about that energy that night. Yeah. And, I agree. And something shifted, uh, for me, obviously something shifted for Christian and, you love when it comes together like that. I mean, those are the games you live for. Um, obviously, you want to win championships, but at the end of the day, you think about the games that stick out or where your backs are against the wall. It didn't seem likely. Nobody really believed it was going to happen. And then one thing changed. Mm -hmm. And that's life. Yeah. Your back's against the wall. You, you're in a dead-end street. You don't think anything's, your future is going to be a certain direction, and bang, something changes. Intuition tragedy sometimes and you know wake up just to life in a new way epiphany mm -hmm. finally say fuck it i've had enough quit major change you know but it all starts usually with taking ownership of your role in life and saying no no i'm going to show up as the king or the queen mm -hmm. in my life and i'm not going to give in to the anti me. I'm not going to give in to the outside world or any any force that wants to bring me down, hold me down, keep me down. That's when you can step into your power. Yeah, I remember when uh, when Mace kicked that field goal to win the game. Like the the joy of that moment for me. You know, I've had it a couple times in my life. I had it when my friend Bodie won the gold medal. I had it when my friend TJ won the championship against Hen and Brow. When Cody No Love won the championship against Dominic Cruz. These are all my friends. And even though that was a middle of season game and we didn't know if it was going to ultimately, quote, matter to the ultimate arc of the season, that that win for me was like, it's this flood of emotion where you're. I was so happy that all I could do was just sob, you know, because like it's a, it's a kind of love that you have for somebody else that, you know, it's the most beautiful thing. And if anybody hasn't experienced that feeling of rooting for somebody so much, like so much that, that like, and not, and not trying to shield yourself. And this was, this was my commitment to myself in the game. Like don't shield myself from the utter heartbreak or the utter ecstasy of it. Cause there's a way that you can remove yourself and just observe yourself and like, ah, it'll be all right. You know, like no matter what, it's going to be fine. And you can like put yourself and you can do that as a player or you can do that as a, as a fan, but to like go in and be like, no, I'll be wrecked. I'll allow, I'll have the courage to be fucking devastated or I'll have the courage to feel like the ecstasy of this. And that's, that's the way of the warrior poet, right? Like that's the commitment to be, no, I'm all in, I'm pushing all my emotional chips in here. And to do that, you know, in support of your brother or your sister, when they're doing their thing, it's like, it's a feeling that you just can't describe, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. And to me, it's transcended the ecstasy of any feeling of anything that I've ever done. And again, I haven't had like a massive athletic career or anything like that, but th there's been incredible moments of accomplishment and achievement for me. Like the moment my book was made it on the New York times bestseller list or anything like that. It's always when it's me, it's always been like, right on. Mm -hmm. 
Like hmm. that's cool. But then yeah. when it's like it's somebody, somebody I love, I fucking lose my shit. Yeah. You know? And that was it was just such a such a cool moment. And of course, like seeing you back at the house and just knowing that we knew we knew the story within the story. We knew the game within the game that was happening. And it got to play out in this unbelievably dramatic stage. Yeah, you know, first of all, you know, thank you. Like the way you showed up for me this year is incredible, you know, and that's what you do for you, the people you love and anybody that knows you and loves you because of that characteristic. And I just knew like how much it meant to me and also because of how much love we have for each other, like how much it would mean to you. Mm-hmm. And so you had already gone home, right? You had gone back to the house yeah. because I was, I was long at the stadium. Yeah. And, you know, this is like, you know, giving away the ending to my darkness retreat a little bit, but it was the exact same feeling seeing you walk across the, the dining room table or the, you know, from the room you're staying mm-hmm. in into where I was at in the dining room. Um, it was the same feeling I got when I opened my eyes out of darkness. And that was just an overwhelming sense of love for life. Yeah. Because I was looking at my brother who I knew was like so proud Yeah, and also knew how much went into that and yeah. how much it mm-hmm. meant to me. And because it meant so much to me, it meant so much to you. And there, you know, we were in ceremony together. Like we've had incredible deep conversations, but moments like that lock in the friendship for lifetime. For sure. And remind you, even at your low points, like I'm always going to be able to count on this man to be, Mm -hmm. be by my side. To the end. Thanks bro. To the end. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. You're in the darkness and you know, you've had incredibly high moments like that, that come through the challenge of it. You know, like you said in the season before, like, isn't this romantic, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the romance of the season, you know, the pain, the joy, the, all of this, that's something you've been doing for a long time. This is a pivotal decision point. You're going into the darkness. So open up how you started to think when, when you turned yourself from your own inward gaze to heal what you needed to heal to get the kind of rest and that kind of parasympathetic drop and to really plumb deep and you turned your inner eye to football what started going through your head um on the third day i kind of woke up as usual um brushed my teeth in the real smart way (laughs) uh you know after eating some breakfast and then kind of getting into my meditation and, and, and long bath. And, and it kind of came to me like today you are going to experience your life, uh, in the present and in the near future and in the long-term future that you are retired. So today you are retired. What does that look like? What does that feel like? And I think there were a lot of, uh, you know, amazing things that came through and, and I had to work through a lot too. When you, you know, when you've played as long as I have, I think we there's something inside us that wants to say, you know, I'm going to be totally fine when I'm done playing. I got nothing left to prove. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, mm-hmm. I've accomplished a ton in this sport and I have, and you know, I don't, uh, I don't need to play. Uh, you know, for anything other than, than the joy. And I'll be totally fine in, in retirement. I got a lot of stuff going on and I got plenty of things I can transition into. But sitting in the darkness with your thoughts, you know, I woke up that morning probably about 3.30 or 4, thinking it was maybe like 8.30 or 9, mm-hmm. you know? So mm-hmm. I had maybe nine hours till when, you know, dinner was coming, where in fact I had, you know, what? I had like 14 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so by the time you go through, you know, your breakfast and, uh, meditation and bath and stuff 
you got a good 12, 11, 12 hours to like just think in the quiet, just you and your thoughts. And a lot of insecurity and fear came up around what retirement looks like um, that I hadn't really acknowledged or uh, even thought was there. I thought, I'm fine. You know, I got, you know, I got my foundation. I got, uh, you know, philanthropic stuff I want to be a part of. I got business stuff that I've been cultivating for years now. Um, I have, you know, dreams outside the game. I want to travel. I want to, uh, you know, get my body, you know, back and not wake up hurting, you know, and all these different thoughts that I, th- mm-hmm. that I thought was like my justification for, I'll be totally fine. I got friendships. I got, you know, I got plots of land next to best friends and, mm-hmm. and life to experience and, and, you know, hopefully fatherhood and kids and all these different things. But there were some deep insecurities and fears that, that came up in the darkness around what retirement uh, is. And, and I really had to sit with those and then go to the root of what those are and trace those back to uh, childhood or trace those back to college or trace those back to early days in the NFL and, and work through those moments uh, that came up and, and the insecurities. And the beautiful thing was by the, you know, uh, probably by what seemed like what now looking back was probably early afternoon, you know, so after five or six hours of kind of going through that, I, I found a really nice sweetness and, comfort in the reality that I was sitting with that day, which was retirement Mm -hmm. and what that would look like and what wouldn't uh, nourish my soul best. Uh, Where would I want to live? Who would I want uh, to spend time with? What do I want to do with my free time? Where would I want to travel? How would I fill the competitive hole in my heart uh, that uh, is because I played sports since I was, you know, six years old. so a really beautiful, uh, beautiful ending to that, but a lot of really difficult um, contemplations around um, all this insecurity and fear that came up of like, what happens when when they when they turn those when they turn the lights off to your career, you know? Mm-hmm. What happens when you're oh, when somebody says, "Oh, you, you used to be Aaron Rodgers, right?" Mm-hmm. Well, I still am, right? Um, I think the overarching, uh, message that, that really hit me both days. So the, the third day was retirement and the fourth day was playing. So the reality that I lived in there is those two days separately was obviously the third day was I'm retired and the fourth day was I'm playing. Um, let's, I just want to like unpack a little bit of some of those insecurities that come up because, you know, a lot of people would they always they always like hypothesize the difficulty that a player will have after they're done playing football right like they they project because it's you know again they expect and also the the energy around it is that you are you are a football player and that's what you do and that's you've the entirety of your personhood is reduced to how you perform on the field and so there's a lot of collective energy around that and so people assume that there's going to be an identity crisis they assume that to me when i step down as ceo of on it like are you going to be okay and i'm like yeah i'm gonna be i'm gonna be fine you know i did i did my thing i brought on it to the best place that i could possibly go and it was time for me to step back and let someone else run it and it was also because that happened honestly that actually happened you know right after my darkness retreat like really? within within two weeks after my darkness retreat, I handed over the CEO ship of on it to Jason Havy, which is the best decision I could have made. But I was able to actually think that through in the darkness and see if there was anything else attached to the letters, you know, CEO, you know, behind behind my name. And to me, it was like, no, I know myself in the fullness of who I am and that doesn't reduce it, but the whole world was projecting like how much, how difficult that must be for me. And in, in, in this case, it's, you know, and that's a smaller version of what, of what you were talking about here for you, because that was only a sh- relatively shorter period of my life, one decade rather than three decades <laughs> of, of football. But what was it like, what was it actually that, the insecurity came up about was it that you were worried maybe you wouldn't love yourself or that other people wouldn't love you or that 
you know, like what was it precisely that that really came up um, that you had to work through? I don't think that there was one the one specific thing. It was a combination of a lot of things, but it was everything from irrelevance to boredom to if I think it's probably this, if if not anything, it's regret. Mm-hmm. It's uh, living a life and regretting making this decision. Not knowing what could have been. What could have been. Um, and the, so that's the fear part. You know, the fear is waking up every single day and wishing, you know, I was retired if I was playing or wishing I was playing if I was retired. And the reality I was sitting in day three was I was retired. So waking up and going, what are you doing? You should be playing. Mm -hmm. How, you know, why are you, you know, why were you so scared of whatever failure or, you know, uh, hanging on too long or whatever it might be that you just every single day regretting that decision. But the other stuff came up was the insecurity of, of, okay, what am I, if I'm not, you know, not playing, like, does anybody, who am I to people now? And not the media, like, not like, not like, you know, anybody going to give a shit what I'm doing anymore. Like, I'm, it's not about that, but about like, who am I to people, to my, to my people, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm not providing a game to come to, mm-hmm you know, and an experience to have. And, uh, how do they look at me now? And am I still, it's, it's the stuff I was dealing with and I am. Am I still lovable? Am I still interesting? Am I still worthy to be uh, included in mm-hmm. community and, and included in activities? And will people still want me around? Um, which are all brilliant lies from the anti-me. Yeah. Brilliant for sure. though. For sure. Because they can hit you on triggers of, they go back to childhood of being a kid who was, you know, athletic, but also really smart. So not quite, you know, they're like super jocks and not quite the nerdy kid and didn't really, you know, have the, you know, popularity that uh, maybe I wanted when I was, you know, in elementary school and junior high. Cause that's such a interesting formal years for us where, Kids are, you know, can be really tough, you know, at times. For sure. And, and then finding my way through life as, uh, you know, as a young person in sports and then dealing with, um, you know, family life and teachers and coaches and obstacles to get to where I was at. And then the regret of like, I put in all that work just to like walk away when I still could play. Like, mm-hmm. Is that what I really want to do? But the overarching theme that came through in both days was an idea that I'd always set up, I think, as a uh, a way to protect myself. And that is that there is life and then there is football. And the reason I set it up like that was because I never wanted to be just a football player because mm-hmm. I'm a smart guy who went on Jeopardy and won and hosted Jeopardy. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested in all these other things. And look how don't, you know, pigeonhole me as just a football player, mm-hmm. you know. I'm not a dumb jock. And I fought so hard for this, what seems now ridiculous um, way to, you know, uh, differentiate uh, my life or private life and my career. But what hit me in the darkness uh, on both days, as I said, as a retired player and as a current player, was that my life is football. My life and football are connected. And that's totally okay. Mm. Um, I always thought that if that was the case, that I would only find my identity in football and then I would never be able to walk away easily. And I would never be able to uh, be seen as somebody who was like, not just a, you know, a dumb, uh, you know, football player. Um, But football has been my life, has given, given so much to my life. And uh, it's a part of my life. So it's connected to my life. And there's no difference uh, my life and my happiness is directly connected to how I feel about football. And it gave me such a deep, um, calm 
about the decision because I finished those two days with deep love and admiration and blessings in, in a uh, a retired life um, of fulfilling you know all the needs that I have and spending time with the people that I love and having no regrets about the game and then also a reality of going back and playing but not playing to out of spite uh, to to prove something to someone for the money but playing because I fell in love with this game when I was six years old and it makes my life better. Mm. And I'm happy. Mm-hmm. I'm happy when I'm with my guys and I'm happy when I'm with my people out there battling, working out during the week, practicing, traveling, playing cards, spending time with, with those people and trying to pass on any of the wisdom that I got. This reminds me of a, uh, of a model that, uh, you know, Mark Gaffney talks about a lot and it's a three-stage model and the first stage is pre-tragic and this is where you're just playing football and you're not really thinking about too much, at least not consciously. You're just kind of playing football and enjoying playing football. You get, you know, we're talking early career stuff. It's like, holy shit, I'm out here. I'm fucking balling. Like, this is great. I always dreamed of this, you know, and it's, you're not thinking about too much else other than that. It's the pre-tragic. It's like the original Edenic state before you eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, right? Mm. And of course, lots of interpretations of that myth. But then there's the tragic stage where you actually start to realize like, wow, I don't want to be solely identified with this game of football. I need to actually carve out an identity that's separate because I'm aware of the challenges that could come from this, you know, losing my identity in the game. So you create a, a split, a rift between your life and football. There's what you do and then there's your work, you know, and then what I'm hearing you say now is what would be the post-tragic stage, which is the second sweetness, which is actually having all of the knowledge of the tragic, all of the knowledge of what can happen, all of the knowledge internally and externally about the game, and then the potential to step back in, in the second sweetness and go like, man, I fucking love this game. (laughs) This is, this is fucking cool. You know, and that's the, you know, that it seems like as you're going into day four, and I want to hear about the meditations on day four, but it seems like you were able to access the timeline where you could play football in the full post-tragic stage of consciousness, where it's the second innocence, where it's just really the love for the game. Yeah, I think it was breaking down that... uh what I'd set up in my mind that I'm not just a football player. And when I'd say that, you know, my life and football are one, um, what I, what I found was I looked around in my life and I said, look at all that football has given me. Even being in this hole is because, (laughs) you know, I met you And we connected after you watched me play a game and say, how can you not be romantic about football? We'd already met each other, but we became close after that moment, which was when I was deeply in love with football in that moment after beating the Niners, an incredible game. The reason I'm in this hole is because I met you on a deep level and became brothers with you. Mm -hmm. Looked at my life like, uh, I have uh, three godsons now, you know, and I'm so thankful for them. And their fathers and mothers, you know, but fathers mostly was, was who I was friends with, uh, all met in some way, shape, or form because of football. Um, two of my best friends in the world, one of them is Randall Cobb, uh, who uh, Kate is my my godson. Uh, you know, I met him through football. David Bakhtiari has blocked for, for me for a decade, watching my backside as one of my closest friends in the whole world. And somebody I can call on at any time and like, hey, I need you to cheer me up today. You know, mm-hmm. with so many days, we'd be driving around on that golf cart he got me and just those moments, you know, football. Yeah. My house, the money, the opportunities, the people I've met, football 
So like, instead of trying so hard to be, I'm not just a football player. What if I just embraced I am a football player? Mm. And look at how fucking beautiful it's impacted my life. Six years old watching Joe Montana drive down the field and win a championship and dreaming and waking up saying I'm all grown up, man. And this game taught me how to be a man, taught Mm -hmm. me about life, Mm -hmm. gave me some of the deepest friendships that I'll have the rest of my life. And some of the most incredible moments. And the temperance, right? Like if you want to have a strong blade of your soul and your consciousness and your in your psychology, like you got to go into the forge. Somehow you need the heat. You need the hammer. You like all people need the forge if you're going to forge strong steel. If you want that Hattori Hanzo fucking super katana, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, like you have to go into the heat and the hammering and the pressure applied from football itself. Of course, you can look at it like, fuck, this is a negative thing. But there's also the other aspect of it was like, it's a chance to go put your current self into the forge and any weaknesses that are there, any cracks will be emerged from the pressure. You know, pressure always reveals the cracks and it also strengthens all of your positive attributes as well. So it's not only the beautiful parts, but it's also the fucking gnarly parts that forge a stronger self and soul and so you know i can at least see what an incredibly strong forge football is fuck when i play my rec league basketball with like three fans vibing one of them like (laughs) i'm learning shit about it's a small little forge for me maybe because i have fucking i'm too competitive for playing in rec leagues but it's a big deal to me and it's like there's a i'll reveal aspects of my psyche i'll reveal I remember there was one time in this past season where I thought I was well beyond this, but close to the end of the game and close to the end of the game. And we were like, we were down by one. We needed to score. And like, I had a chance to make it like make a move and take the shot. But I thought like, oh man, like I had that anti me come up, like don't miss the last shot, man. So I fucking passed it. Homie misses the shot. I managed to get the rebound and I put it in and it sort of like saved the day, but I finished and we won the game, but I finished. And I like, I was like quiet. And I was like, why, why are you quiet? You know, <laughs> poor Vi. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm like taking this like a real, like a Vi's real. your biggest cheerleader. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you won, won. You know, you fucking did. you made that shot. And I was yeah. like, but I know secretly that there is a little voice of the anti me that came up and, and made me a slight little coward in that moment where I said, I don't want the pressure of this game winning shot, because what if I miss it? And I got to see that part of myself and go like, all right, motherfucker, like you won that time and it all worked out in the end. You know, of course it doesn't matter. It's a rec league, but, but like I learned something. It all matters. Yeah, it does. It matters to the, it matters to the forging of the blade of who I am, you know, and even the pressure of a rec league game with a couple fans and a team that, you know, of course we're fucking giving it, trying to win our best. That's a, that's what makes it interesting is when you give it everything you got but uh it's such a powerful tool to use about life and that's what people who don't play ball or don't play any sport or don't compete i don't think they understand that this is the place where you practice life like this is the place where you start to really learn who you are and how to navigate and that's why like you know when i have kids yeah i'm not going to force them to play any sport but competition is, you know, if I can impart anything upon them, it's like, this is a necessary aspect. And I'll be leading by example. Of course, they'll see me and Uncle Aaron. Say, gonna me and me Uncle to, Aaron fucking You're going, want me to take it easy on you. Know, <laughs> going at it. help my parenting out today? <laughs> Kid's going to be watching, right? So just like, you know, just let me win this one so he feels good about his day, you know, being like, you know, pretty awesome. And then the next time, you know, we won't. he won't come to the game and, and you can win. <laughs> yeah, 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 some version of, some version of that. It Some version, that, right? something like that. But, you know, it's, it's, this is, uh, and I learned that from my mom, you know, professional tennis player, semifinals of Wimbledon. Like she didn't, I just, it was just in my, I knew it. Like I knew that was in my blood and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be anywhere close to the human that I am if it wasn't for competing full out. Like I wouldn't know myself. Hmm. I like, wouldn't know myself at all. And I think that's. Or your limits. Exactly. Yeah. 
Exactly. So, all right. So you're building, now you're building this kind of internal mental case for, fuck, maybe I come back. Mm. So, so bring us into your, the way you started thinking about that fourth day of like, all right, maybe I'm back. How does this look? What does this feel like? What fucking, and I know all the, obviously the question everybody wants to know, what fucking jersey are you wearing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, lots of those type of questions. Well, you know, so day three happens and it ends and it's just super beautiful and I feel great about it. And I feel like, man, I just kind of healed that like insecurities about retirement and, you know, that I, you know, I don't need to retire because I'm tired. I just retire because that's what serves my soul the best. That's what nourishes me the best. And that's what, you know, that's the the next step in my journey. I'm feeling just like super great about it. I wake up in the morning. I'm like, all right, one more day, one more night and I'm out. You know, maybe I'll, you know, entertain what it'd be like to to play today. But we'll see what comes through. Like, I feel great about, mm. you know, where I'm at. And then, yeah, so I go through my breakfast and bath, meditation. I'm like laying in bed going, what if I did play this year? <laughs> and so I went through that whole thing. And, you know, I love football. I always have. I used to say it's my favorite sport when I wasn't even allowed to play it yet. Mm -hmm. I'd be playing basketball, baseball, soccer, and people would say, what's your favorite sport? I'd say, football. Of course, football. Well, you don't even play. It's like, yeah, but it's my favorite. I'm going to play. At some point, I'm going to be a quarterback. Mm -hmm. And famous story that we told last time, famous for me, but, you know, with that crazy uh, food appreciation teacher at Cal who told me I never amount to anything in the league. Um, <laughs> you know, there were some people along the way who definitely helped, you know, yeah, with inspiring me to like, oh yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, let's see about that, mm-hmm. huh? Yeah. See who's laughing less. But, so there's always sources of inspiration to, uh, to that. But when you have that deep, deep love for the game, um, it's not that hard to, to start that idea in your mind. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to love it first and foremost. That's great. How would I want to, and why would I want to play? And what are the reasons for playing? I don't feel like I have anything left to prove, um, for the most part. I mean, you say that, but there's always like, but you know, I could still prove, you know, one thing. Of course, yeah, and, yeah. It's 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 you in you it's, transcend it, but include accomplish. Also. Yeah, yeah. I don't feel like I have anything left to accomplish. Like for people, like show you, like, hey, mm-hmm. I can do this. You know, like, or I got to win another Super Bowl so people, you know, think is you know think of me in a you know higher sense. Like, no, I don't. I don't need to do any of that. Yeah, I love playing, and that's a good enough reason. But what's going to make it most enjoyable? You know, what do I love about the game? Competition, of course. You know, laying it on the line. But all the other stuff that goes before it, you know, the mental game Monday to Saturday, the discipline, um, the little advantages you try and gain through diet or sleep or mm-hmm. meditation or uh, acupuncture, whatever it might be that you, you're you doing. And I've done a number of different things over the years to try and like, I'm going to try this and see if this works or this works or these herbs or this tea or this, whatever it might be that, you know, this diet, you know, I'm going to eat vegan this year. I'm going to eat, uh, you know, right. uh, um, paleo or I'm going to try different things for different advantages. But, but at the root of it is, you want to be, but you want to be the best. Yeah. You love competing, and you want to dominate. And but what makes this sport special is the people. It's people. It's a people business. People win championships. You know, I know teams get the credit for it, but the people win the championships. You win championships, and you have success with great people. And look back on my career in eighteen years, and some incredible, incredible friendships. Some amazing characters that I've played with and some great friendships that I've made. Um, And I thought a lot about what made our best teams best. What made them a cut above the other ones? And it was a group that was super connected, that really, truly enjoyed each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what teams are always trying to replicate is how do you, you know, how do you create that environment? Um, I think there's a lot of different ways, but um, you have to allow for leadership on a football team to take control of the locker room and to to uh, to set the parameters and the goals, 
And then you have to have it wrapped in accountability. There has to be accountability because that is life. There's accountability for actions. There's accountability for decisions that you make. And true accountability, there's two types of accountability in my mind that I've seen in football. One is real accountability and the other is forced accountability. So forced accountability is that there's an environment that exists where people will only do enough to not get in trouble. So they're not put on a decision, actually. They're just doing enough so they won't get fined here. Yeah. They'll, you know, spend, you know, 20 minutes in the sauna to, you know, make their weight instead of, like, you know, actually changing their diet to eat better to make weight. Mm -hmm. They'll make sure they're at this point at the right time or going through their workout set uh, at just the right time or, and just getting their stuff done instead of, you know, no, when we're in here, we're going to actually get our work done. We're going to be on time to meetings. We're going to take notes and meetings. We're, there's two different ways of doing it. One is, you know, one is bullshit. And I've seen a lot of that in the league. Yeah. Where the environment is created where accountability is is forced. And, and there aren't ramifications usually in that for breaking that accountability. And nobody's worried about breaking that eventually. So that's how teams derail. And coaches does that can start, lose Does teams. that start with... I mean, obviously that type of accountability is led by example, mm -hmm. feels, right? So like you play, you play a big part of that by actually leading with your own internal accountability, but it has to be, it seems like it has to be, it has to encompass the coaches, the, the coach, the coaching staff, organization, GM, the whole organization, like all the way top to bottom, there has to be a coherence of a mutual agreement of that accountability. And then what about trust because it seems like that's another key element too it's accountability trust is a part of the other type of accountability right it's the real accountability where i'm going to trust i'm going to create an environment where my players my team can flourish um but ultimately it's on them every single day they have a decision to buy in to what we're doing but in real accountability there involves obviously trust but there involves free will and a decision but when it involves free will and a decision, if you really want it to be real accountability, it has to involve consequences. Where if you do not adhere to the accountability as defined by this player-led team or this team or this locker room or this trip or whatever it might be, then you are there are consequences for that. Mm -hmm. So then people know, I can do whatever the hell I want, but there are consequences. Right. How does this happen a lot of times? You win a lot. When you win a lot, it cures a lot of things. It covers up even more things. Mm. So we've had a lot of success for a long time in Green Bay, right? But there's been definitely years in those 18 where, um, you know, after you go through stretches of winning where some of that accountability starts to lack. Some right. of that structure lacks. But it's all on the. It's ultimately all on the players, uh, the coaches, and the setup of of that accountability um, to allow for people to make a decision to buy in. And the best teams that we've had, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, uh, twenty fourteen, probably twenty twenty. You know, we had player led teams that had enough great great dudes, coaches and players who said. Here's the options. We're going to come together. We're going to spend time together. We're going to we're going to believe in each other, but we're going to get our work done. And we're going to understand that everything that we do matters. And we're on a decision. You fuck up, you late to something, you fine. No questions asked. You know? Yeah. You do something that brings your negative attention to the team, you know, then there'll be ramifications. You know, recently I went through, saw, uh, in my own medicine journey recently, I was getting some body work from a really talented body worker as I was in my medicine journey, which has become kind of a part of a uh, practice that I have, understanding that the body, the soma, carries a lot of both karmic trauma and, you know, in this case, it really felt like karmic trauma. And she was working like rolfing style with her elbow between, the, between my ribs and my back in a place that I've never had worked that intensely. And she just intuitively was guided to it. And I went into this state of like, again, I'm on, I'm on medicine and ketamine and cannabis. And I go into this state where I see myself in the heat of battle, just swarmed by orcs, let's say, 
you know, if we're going for Middle Earth analogy, but swarmed by orcs. And I just have my sword pulled, war's bane is just singing. And I'm just, but I'm getting fucking overrun. And I look to my left and right to see Legolas and Gimli and whoever else might be there, my fucking brothers. And they weren't there. It's like, where are you? Where? And I just start saying, and I got, I get emotional thinking about it. It was like, where are you? Like, where are you? Like, here I am in the, I'm in the fucking fray. Like, I'm taking shots. I'm bleeding. And we know that this is the path. Like, we have to make it through this. And they weren't there in this karmic replay of this wound. And to me, of course, sports is still sports. It's not fighting the orcs, but it's a way to feel that and access that kind of feeling. And I think the real accountability is not because you'll get punished as a deserter. Like, it's not like, yes, the Spartans, yes, if you deserted, you were dead. So accountability, like you said, fines, whatever, that's, that's the framework. But for sure, the reason why the Spartans didn't turn and run is because they loved each other to a point where like they would never, if they saw fucking Leonidas looking and some like that moment of shame is far worse than death. Far worse. Far worse than death. So it's that kind of bond of like, I wouldn't dare sell this workout short or this practice short because I love my brothers and I'm going to go to battle for them, with them to the fucking end. 100%. And that's exactly what I'm trying to say is that those teams that loved each other had that deep knowledge that, you know what, everything we do matters because I owe it to the guys Yeah, on my right, on my left, in that locker room, in that huddle, because they're all counting on me. And what greater tragedy than to not be there for your brothers? Yeah when you're needed. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's, uh, it's specific to one organization. I think businesses have the same issues when you have sustained, sustained success for a while. You start to think like, Oh, we're an autopilot. This is what's going to happen all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And you start letting little things Go. This is this is. It can happen to an individual as well, not just not just an organization. I mean, we we have this. I think we have this collective sense of the wrongness of when a player steps out of that, and you know that a player is just there for their own stats, and they don't actually give a shit about the team and about their brothers that are out there playing. Like everybody has this sense. Like this is fundamentally wrong, and I think it's from thousands of years of you know, our ancestors, no matter what ancestry you come from, you've been in battle, you've been in war, you know, our ancestry stretching back to fucking Atlantis and before, right? Like the deep, and everybody's like, oh, he said Atlantis, whatever. It's fucking look at Graham Hancock and figure it out, call it what you want. But there was old civilizations, everybody's just gonna have to deal with it. And shit keeps getting older. <laughs> it keeps getting older. Right, it keeps getting older. Shout out to Graham and Randall and all the Anthony West, all the FIFA who are out, you know, illuminating this but for thousands of years this has been a part of us and in this kind of it's like a microcosm of what that would be like and we know that it's wrong yeah. when someone chooses self over the team well because we know that person goes out by themselves in our war party either he's dying or we're dying yep so you just innately know like this is fucked up that something bad's gonna happen here right and that was the idea of the phalanx where everybody locked shields. If one person retracted their shield, there was a hole and that hole was then vulnerability for everybody. Yep. Right. And that's the, that's the idea. As soon as one person breaks out, you know, you lose that coherence that actually makes you powerful as a team. Yeah. So, so if you're going to play again, you're going to want to find a situation that that is fucking alive, right? Because otherwise, fuck it. You yeah, know? and you know, it's it's never like, you don't have a list of 32 teams and go, okay, look, uh, this team has that and this team has this. <laughs> and this team doesn't have that and this team may have that. It's Every year is such an interesting, fascinating journey because you don't really know what's going to happen. 
you have ideas and you, there's always, you know, I felt for years and years and years, there was really about, you know, seven or eight teams that could actually win it every year. Every now and then there was a wild card that would, you know, come up and, and make some noise or, or win kind of out of nowhere. But most of the time you had a good feeling as you went into the off season and training camp and even preseason, like, okay, you know, I think, you know, these teams in the AFC are going to be really good and these teams in the NFC are going to be really good. And it's probably going to be one of these eight teams probably that, that does it. And I don't think that's really changed. I, I, don't, I mean, there's definitely a lot of parity in the league. But ultimately, every year, I think there's, you know, maybe as much as, as many as 12, but more like probably six or eight teams that you feel like really should win it unless something terrible happens injury-wise or uh, they should be be in the mix. So you want to be one of those teams. And I feel like, you know, damn near every year, you know, in Green Bay, we we were that team. We had a chance. Definitely mm-hmm. since 2009, you know, we had a chance to uh, to win it all. We, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, only won it one of those times. But um, but those are things you just can't measure. You can't measure how the chemistry comes right. together. You can't measure how people play on last years of contracts or first years of new contracts. How rookies step up. How uh, veterans, you know, find a role and, and people embrace their role, how new coaches step up, like we had last year with Rich Basaccia, our special teams coach, who totally changed culture like that. You, you thought something could happen like that, but you never knew the type of impact that you're like that can right. have. And that's the beauty in the game. It can happen the opposite way too. You know, you lose certain, uh, certain players or certain coaches and those roles or voids aren't filled, uh, then it can definitely take from the team. Yeah, um, and I've seen that over the years too. You know, and some of that is you just can't get anything about it. A guy gets hurt, or maybe a guy gets an opportunity to go coach somewhere else, or you know, things change, promotions. There's been obviously, uh, you know, uh, Mike Sherman was my coach my rookie year. He got fired. A whole new staff came in. Mike McCarthy was there for 13 years. He got fired uh, after that. New staff. So there's been turnover, but um, it, it's always about the people. So, yeah. So who are those people uh, that are gonna? create that environment uh, that's best. And then also, you know, like, yeah, I'm under contract with the Packers for sure. So if I decide uh, to play, like uh, first is a conversation with them, you know, Mm -hmm. where are you guys at? Like, honestly, like um, I've been there 18 years and and I have so much love for Green Bay and the organization. I mean, 18 years, that's a teenager. Mm -hmm. But like the second last year of being a teenager, you know, that's, yeah. think about how you felt at 18 and all the lessons you learned and driving and dating women and mm-hmm. finishing high school and just, you know, that's what I did in one city playing there. Um, and learn, you know, I got there, I was 21 years old, you know, now I have, you know, gray hair and gray on my beard and uh, started 15 seasons and uh, know the city inside and out and my favorite places and, and a ton of people outside the facility who are, I, I call friends. and um, Amazing Indian food in Green Bay, oh by the way. Oh, my God. Surprising. India Bhavan, man. <laughs> Shout out Just, to India Bhavan. We ate that probably. Hey, thank you, guys. <laughs> Incredible, man. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's, and if, for those of you who don't know where it is, it's a, in the, where the Hooters used to be. <laughs> it hasn't been there for a long time, and I have to admit, I only was there one time yeah. in 2006. Like India Bhavan, I got to say, it's probably an upgrade. It's a, Yeah, it's definitely an upgrade. It's yeah. uh, phenomenal. But, uh, yeah, man, God, I miss that place. Yeah, yeah that's incredible. Sure. That was like every Friday or Saturday was India Bhavan. Definitely when you were in town. We were, oh, yeah, we, we, went, we went deep. <laughs> we went deep. <laughs> So if you had to, if you had to say right now, and I know this, people are probably hoping that this podcast yields this concrete decision. This is the, this is what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing, but it feels like very much there's still a process and also conversations that you need to have conversations with Green Bay and a, and a sense of what other, what other opportunities are out there that actually get you really excited, get you fired up. Yeah, I mean, I think people have to first, you know, I don't know when they're going to see this, but we're like 48 hours getting out of the dark and actually getting my eyes back. So, you know, 48 hours ago, I was in the dark and you know, now I'm, I'm out. But uh, it's been a lot of time uh, reflecting out of that and journaling and um, trying to... Uh, really 
adjust back to uh, this reality, even though there's only four days, but so much happened during that time. And there's just so much contemplation out of that because I, there's really four separate days and many different topics. Um, I think as much as anything, before there, there felt like uh, one scary option and one uh, unknown. That's mm. what that's what the two the, the two felt like. Now that's not how I would describe them before I went to darkness. Right. But in, in the darkness, the realization was one option was scary and one was unknown. And which was which? The scary was uh, retirement, mm -hmm. and the unknown was um, going back and playing. And what does that mean? Is that Green Bay? Is that somewhere else? If that's somewhere else, you know, what is it like being somewhere else? And now it feels like there are two very uh, beautiful options um, that both feel really nourishing and um, special and that it's just life. And life is about making decisions and uh, living your great name story and going through the ups and downs of the journey because that's what makes the best stories. The best stories aren't, you know, the most incredible high and everything went your way. And no, it was like, can you believe this happened after this and this and this, and mm. then this happened. And then we overcame this and then we overcame that. And in, in that story, the great story, there's mistakes, there's regrets, there's sadness, there's joy, there's frustration, there's sorrow, there's heartbreak, there's elation. It's all part of it. It's all part of life. And my life has been football for as long as I can remember. And I'm fucking damn proud of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're still nasty. You know, I saw something from Alan Lazard and I really appreciated what he said. Someone asked him what he thought about you as a football player. And he just goes, he's the best player to pick up a football ever, period. And I know a lot of people might disagree with that claim, but he's someone who's been your teammate and been with you. And, and, you know, I think there's that feeling like fucking a, like, and I can say like when we compete and stuff, like there's no, like you still got your fucking, you got your fire, you got your body, you still got the skills. So it's not, you know, even though the anti me voice might say like, I don't know, sometimes but i think you do know that you still fucking got it and that's also like another one of these factors of like man i can still fucking ball i've been doubted before uh, <laughs> and look honestly i felt in the first year that matt was here matt was in green bay in 19 i felt at times like a game manager like it was just i didn't quite understand what we were doing at times on offense and my job was to take care of the football, and I did. You know, I threw four interceptions and 26 touchdowns, and we were 13-3. and three. But I felt like there was so much more. And, you know, then they drafted my replacement, and then I went MVP twice. And I threw, you know, 85 touchdowns and nine interceptions in two years. And obviously there were some changes that happened on the team and the coaching staff. And I didn't have my best year plan. And there's probably people that think I'm done. I thought I was done, you know, before I became COVID MVP twice. Hmm. So, again, there'd be plenty of inspiration down that road. Yeah. But uh, I have a great piece about it that I did yeah. not have without the darkness. So I'm really thankful for that experience. Um, and the stuff I work through, it's all connected. Like, it's all one big through line life and part of that is relationships and friendships and experiences at football yeah so if you set a kind of timeline for yourself where you know like all right one way or another i'm going to make a decision by this point or are you still leaving it kind of with uh with some leeway well i think it's best for Anybody who has an interest in this to make a decision sooner rather than later. You know, I remember, you know, when Favre, uh, before he retired, you know, there were times where he, it was in April and May and he still 
you know, we weren't sure if he was going to come back because he didn't come to any of the offseason program. And, and then in 2008, he actually did retire in March and then kind of said, no, 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 actually in June, after OTAs, I actually want to come back and play. And then that's when, you know, I've been traded to the Jets and, you know, there was obviously a lot of tension that summer. But um, for for everybody involved directly and indirectly, it's best for a decision earlier. And I feel I feel really good about um, about the conversations that um, that are going to be had that have been had with uh, important people in my life, yourself included. That. Um, help to orient me, but I'm not looking for somebody to tell me what the answer is. Uh, all the answers are right inside me, and I, I touched uh, many of them, and definitely the feelings uh, on both sides during the darkness. And I'm thankful for that time. But um, you know, it's a very uh, there's a finality to the decision, mm-hmm. and I don't make it lightly. I don't want to drag anybody around. Look, I'm answering questions about it because I get asked about it. Um, I'm talking about it because it's important to me. If you don't like it and you think it's drama, you think I'm being a diva or whatever, then just tune it out. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Mm-hmm. But this is my life. It's important to me. And I'll make a decision soon enough and then we'll go down that road and be really excited about it. Yeah, brother. Well, you know, for me as, you know, really... In many, in many ways, you're my best friend in the universe, you know, and I know we haven't known each other for the lifetime that usually causes that to happen, but it's that type of energy. And I have some other best friends in the universe too, you know, that you've become friends with as well, Eric and Makad and, you know, some of the other friends that you're getting to know more like Kyle and all, you know, the whole crew and the posse, of course. And there's, for me, it's, I just really... I want you to be fucking happy. And there's a timeline where we get to spend, instead of the season, we get to go mm-hmm. travel around the world and do some wild shit, go into ceremony and see some amazing places and start some fun projects. And then there's another timeline where I'm coming to see you in some city and maybe we're eating Indian bhavan or maybe we're eating <laughs> some fucking hakasan or maybe we're eating some other thing, you know, like whatever that might be there's both of these timelines. And for me, I have just absolute equal excitement about both because I trust you to make the best decision for you. And I wouldn't want to make, wouldn't want you to make any other decision than that. And, uh, so I'm fucking, I know everybody here is like, man, I was hoping Aaron would fucking say and say like, it's going to be this team or this team or this team and I'm doing it or not. But, uh, but you know, if you care about Aaron and you care about actually putting the human before and before the player, which is important, you know, then, then I think you got to care about taking the time to make this best decision for you, which will ultimately yield the best decision for whatever team that you're in. Because if you're unreconciled, if you're halfway in and halfway out, that's the only decision that would be a disservice is to, is to play, but you didn't really want to, or, not play but you really did want to and you really could you know so this is a sacred period of time and uh i'm eagerly waiting with big bated breath and excited about both fucking options so i'm right here with all of you who are trying to figure out what this man's going to do and uh from a different perspective you know obviously as such a close friend to you but well you can also say like i'm not you know, being coy right now, and I've told you kind of off camera. Like, yeah, hey, exactly. No, like, I've like <laughs> we're not going to talk about it today. Well, like, yeah, you know what's going on, right? Now. Like, yeah. No, I'm in, I'm enjoying. I mean, listen, listen. You know, this is a special weekend because you know there's a really, really special individual who was born. Thank you, my brother, my Pisces brother. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're celebrating you, and. I don't want to upstage, you know, your birthday with some big <laughs> announcement about like my future. So that's priorities, uh, bro. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough, my brother. Fair enough. Well, it's an honor to share this life adventure with you. And I know that like we both know in our bones that 
you know, one day we're going to be old men, you know, still smoking cigars. Scrapping. Scrapping. <laughs> fucking scrapping till the bitter end and having having a great time and a great life. And, and to see that both choices yield this great life. And uh, it's a beautiful place that sets me at ease to know that, you know, my friend Aaron is going to be happy no matter what, you know, and that's uh, that's what matters most to me. Yeah, I appreciate that. What I saw in both the third and fourth days was I saw myself, my full self, at the end of that journey on the one side. And I saw my full self at the end of that journey on the other side. I wasn't missing anything. Mm -hmm. I was fully myself in both those timelines. And that was a really sweet, sweet thing to experience. Yeah. And so it is, brother. To the end. To the end. To the end. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We love you guys. Aaron, is there any final words you want to share before we bounce out of here and continue this weekend's adventure? Uh, let's party. Let's fucking go. Let's fucking go. Much love, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Peace. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.